This morning, as you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew 28. Uh, some of you noticed that during the one song, Blessings, uh, Sandy was getting a little teary eyed. And uh, I don't know exactly why, but just wanted to share with you as uh, Jen and Sandy sing that song. They both have been through numbers of issues that sometimes are difficult to go through, but God can turn into blessings. And uh, remind you to keep Sandy and Jason in your prayers as Sandy is trying to get pregnant. Uh, and uh, so pray for them as they go through that process of meeting with the doctors and that if the Lord would bless them with a the child, they will rejoice. If the Lord uh, chooses not to let them be pregnant, they will continue to rejoice. But either way, uh, they ask for your prayers. But speaking of births and pregnancy, Christy and Josh Butcher also have found out that they are expecting. So many times you come to church and it's so easy to smile and put on a face and uh, just say, oh, how are you doing today? Oh, great. Praise the Lord. How are you? And inside we never share all the hurts and pains and weights that we carry. But life isn't to be lived only on our own. We are to share it with others. And as brothers and sisters, we come to worship, but we also come to share it. Uh, many times the sharing takes place in smaller groups. One of the reasons why we have the uh, the women's and men's Bible studies and the, the breakfast and things like that. Chances to interact and share on a little bit more personal level. Something we never stand up and share publicly, we might share on a one-on-one -on -one level. But uh, this morning we want to uh, come to God's Word. Uh, this will not be a traditional Easter message. If you come looking to see about, uh, you know, who will roll the stone away or ten proofs of the resurrection or you know, hope because of the resurrection. Uh, this is not a typical Easter message. I really didn't think about it when I was planning it out, but uh, really this is a week after Easter message. But some of you won't be here the week after Easter, so we're going to have a message today. Uh, but to start out with, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Uh, this morning, let me ask you a, a question to consider. How would news from the other side change your life? If you had news of what was on the other side of the grave. You know, our, our, our culture is obsessed with <coughs> psychic hotlines. Uh, people spend $300 million a year on psychic hotlines. Uh, tarot card readings and uh, reading tea leaves and reading your palm and telling the future and, and trying seances, trying to have people who died, you know, great grandpa who died years ago and comes back from the dead and speaks <coughs> from the other side. What would it be like if we knew? The story is told of one uh, lady who found out. A man from Illinois had left Chicago for a vacation in Florida. While he was, uh, his wife was away on a business trip and she was planning on meeting him down in Florida the next day. So he reached his hotel early, decided to send his wife a quick email. Uh, he didn't have this slip of paper that he always carried in his wallet that had her email address on it. So he tried to type it out from memory. But unfortunately, he misspelled the email address. I'm sure this happened to some of you. He left out one letter. And instead of getting to his wife, the email ended up going to the widow of a preacher whose husband had passed away only the day before. And so when this grieving widow checked her email, she let out a shout and faded. The family came rushing to see what happened. And they saw, here's Grandma lying on the floor. They looked at the screen and they saw this note. It said, dearest wife, just got checked in. <laughs> Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Your loving husband. Yes, sure is hot down here. <laughs> that type of news would give anyone a cause for alarm. But the truth is that we do have news of what awaits us on the other side of death. And that news is delivered personally to us by one who has died and come back from the dead. 
not by somebody who's making in money hand over fist by pretending to talk to a voice. But Jesus himself, he died, was dead for three days, came back to life, and testifies to us. And we find here in Matthew 28 an account of what happens after the resurrection. Start reading in verse 1. It says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. For there you will see him. Now I, have, now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, as we look at your word this morning, it's easy to read the words, but we need your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see your truth. As we look at a familiar passage that uh, we look at every Easter, help us to see fresh and anew what you have for us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here in Matthew 28, we have the account of the resurrected Jesus coming to the women who came to the tomb early on Easter morning. And Jesus gives a very direct message. It's one that we, we don't normally hear about. Uh, in fact, it is... There are some sites where you can go and get ideas about sermons and people post sermons and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages filled with sermon after sermon after sermon. And none of them that I saw deal with this one phrase. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. <coughs> there they will see me. The thing about that phrase about this past week, it's really one of the most important parts of the resurrection story, but it's one that's always overlooked. You know, he's, he's not here, he's risen, just as he said, come and see the empty tomb. Yes, we hear that all the time. But tell my disciples to go to Galilee. We never hear that. Or if we hear it, it just passes through one ear and out the other. There are a lot of us who have selective hearing. Uh, this phrase is one that Jesus has given to his disciples different times. So we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a minute. <coughs> Jesus had told them, after I'm resurrected, I'll meet you in Galilee. After I rise from the dead, go to Galilee. Here, uh, on the resurrection morning, first of all, the angel says it. Tell the disciples, go to Galilee. Jesus meets the women. Jesus says the same thing. Tell my disciples, my brothers, to go to Galilee. There they will see me. But often, we have selective hearing. We, we hear something, but it doesn't sing again. You wives know what that's all about with your husband. Honey, can you uh, help me with the dishes? Uh -huh. you, know, you know it's not going to happen. We tune things out so easily. Think about this scenario. A friend comes up to you and says, Hey, you look great. You look like you've lost 10 pounds since like, I saw you. And that outfit looks terrific on you. Uh, all of a sudden, that little pimple on your nose. What do we think about? I got a pimple on my nose. Oh, no. That's terrible. How big is it? You know what, does it show in it? Does everybody see this pimple? And we obsess about the negative. We obsess about this one little thing that is wrong instead of thinking, oh, I do look good. I, yeah, I have most weight. Yeah, and I know this is new outfit I bought this for Easter. Instead of all that, we get fixated on the negative. But it's nothing new. Jesus faces the same issues with his disciples. Think about the last supper. Jesus is trying to tell his disciples about servanthood. He wants to teach them to be servants. He wants to give them an example. So he takes off his coat, puts a towel around his waist, and he starts washing their feet. 
And he says, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. It's the lesson of humility, a lesson of serving. But instead of getting what Jesus is trying to tell them, Luke 22 tells us, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered the greatest. Jesus is here trying to say, serve one another. And they're saying, well, you got to be serving me because I'm better, I'm better than Thomas. I'm better than John. I don't know about Peter. And they're just white pecking, establishing the pecking order, determining who the greatest is. But we see again here in uh, Matthew, if you page back to Matthew 26, verse 31. It's at the Last Supper. Jesus is with his disciples. And he tries to communicate to them very important words. He says in 2631 that Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Notice what Jesus says. He says that uh, they are going to fall away and be scattered, and he, as the shepherd, will be struck. But he says, but I'm going to rise. And I am going to rise again, and I will meet you in Galilee. Jesus says, no, I'm going to die, but I will rise again, and I'm going to meet up with you. It's good news that's coming. But what do they hear? They will fall away. They only hear the negative. In fact, if you look down at verse 33, Peter replies, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Jesus said, You're going to fall away and I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise and I'm going to meet up with you. They ignore that completely. They say, well, I'm not going to fall away. I'm not going to deny you. You can just hear them around the table. Not me, Lord. Well, no, don't look at me. Not me either. No, it must be him. Not me. I'm going to be faithful, Lord. And it, it completely goes right over their head. What Jesus is saying about rising again and meeting them in Galilee. They completely missed the point. Jesus is going to rise from the dead. Something that has never happened in all of history except for Jesus. He was going to rise again and then he is going to meet them. He's going to meet them in Galilee. Jesus is saying, put this on your calendar. Circle the date. I am going to meet up with you after I rise from the dead in Galilee. Jesus wants to give them hope. But all they hear are words of despair. They're just, oh, I'm going to fall away. Oh, me. Instead of hearing the hope that Jesus is saying, I'm rising again, and I'm going to meet up with you in Galilee. For all the miracles Jesus did, and all the sermons he preached, there were two key events that Jesus would have circled on his calendar. Maybe three, if you, two sort of go together. The first one was the cross, or the cross and the resurrection together. It was an appointment that was made before the worlds were created. Jesus is called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When Jesus was born, Christmas time, grew up as a little boy, he knew he had an appointment with destiny. He had an appointment with the cross. <coughs> but he knew when that was coming. It didn't surprise him. He counted down the days. He could X them off on his calendar as they were coming. There'd be times he'd be in the city and, and the Pharisees would get the people riled up. Uh, they'd say, you know, uh, are you claiming to be God? And he'd say, I am. And they would pick up stones ready to stone him. And he'd just walk right through the crowd and walk away. Because he knew his time was not yet come. He knew the date. He knew when it was coming. He didn't have to worry because he knew today's not the day. I'm not going to the cross today. I don't have to worry about the crowd. Over and over and over again, we see him say that phrase, waiting to Cana. Uh, his mother, says, they ran out the wine. Can you make more wine, Jesus? He says, well, then my time's not yet come. You know, I'm not, I'm not giving myself as Messiah yet. But to please his mother, you always please your mother, he 
He said, okay. And that was his first miracle, turning the water into wine. Jesus knew that the time was coming. In fact, he told his disciples about it over and over and over again. Matthew 16, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So Jesus started to tell his disciples as the day got close, tell you what, guys, I want, I want you to know, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to rise again. And then it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Peter's probably thinking, don't worry, Jesus, I've got a sword out protection. That's exactly what happens in the garden. They come to get him. Peter pulls his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest. I personally think he's probably trying to cut his head off, but the, you know, the, he probably definitely just got his ear. But Peter's thinking, don't worry, Lord, I'll protect you. But says, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus tried to tell them, I've got an appointment with death. The day's coming. It's already on the calendar. Matthew 16, Matthew 17, Matthew 20. He tells them over and over and over again that he's going to die. He says, you know, I'll be killed and I'll be raised back to life on the third day. But they wouldn't listen. They didn't want to think about Jesus being killed. So many times we like to think, well, maybe Jesus wasn't killed. Maybe he just swooned. Or maybe, maybe they just made up the story. There's a uh, preacher called J. Vernon McGee. A woman once wrote into him a question and said, uh, our preacher says that on Easter, Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? McGee wrote, wrote back to her and said, uh, dear sister, beat your preacher with leather whip for 39 heavy strokes. Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through his heart. Embalm him. Put him in an airless tomb for three days. And then see what he has to say. <laughs> Jesus knew that his death was coming. A literal death. Not just suffering, but death on a cross. But over and over again, he said, you know, my time is not yet come. He knew when it was coming. Uh, he, he, he's coming down to Jerusalem and word comes to him. He says, don't go to the city. They're going to have to get you. And he says, you go tell Herod that old fox. Today and tomorrow I'm going to work miracles. The third day I'll be in Jerusalem. No prophet can die unless he's in Jerusalem. So he knew. Three days out, they're co I'm coming down. He had the date circled on his calendar. His crucifixion and three days later, the resurrection. But if we could look at Jesus' calendar, there would have been a second day star and circled and marked in red. He talked about it over and over and over again, but we miss it completely. And that was his post-resurrection meeting with his disciples. He said, I'm going to meet up with you in Galilee. In fact, it's, uh, it's recorded for us in Matthew, it's recorded in Mark. John also makes a reference to it. After the resurrection, meet me in Galilee. We see it here in Matthew 28, the passage we were in. The angel tells the woman, he's not here, he's risen just as he said, go quickly tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. Then Jesus comes, down in verse 10, 28, 10. Jesus comes to the woman, he doesn't take time to console them and talk about their grief and their sorrow. He simply says, don't be afraid, I, I, I need you to do something for me. Go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. He doesn't say, hey, let's all go back together. He says, no. He says, I, I've got a meeting scheduled. I've got this important date. Tell the disciples, make sure they're there. Make sure they meet me in Galilee. So where do they go? At their favorite fishing spot? No. A lot of the, the disciples were fishermen. They love to fish on the Sea of Galilee. They're out there on the lake all the time. But that's not where they meet. They meet at a mountain. We're not told which mountain. But the disciples knew. Jesus evidently had prearranged a spot, a meeting place, with his disciples. You know, he's told them several times beforehand, after I rise, I'm going to meet up with you in Galilee. So he would have prearranged the spot. But he had slipped their memory because he has such selective memory. 
Their grief had kept them from remembering, but their hope drives them on. Their hope in the resurrection took them north to Galilee. And they do meet Jesus there. If we look down in verse 16 of Matthew 28, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Jesus says, I'm alive, meet me in Galilee. And they go, and they meet Jesus there. But some of them doubted. We're not told exactly what that means. It might mean that some of them went and really questioned, is this really Jesus? I personally think it might mean that some of them said, so, yeah, I'm not going to Galilee. Jesus didn't rise. I'm not going to travel all the way up there. They knew what God wanted them to do, leave Jerusalem, go up to Galilee, but they didn't have the faith. It's like many times, many of us know what God wants us to do, but we end up not doing the things we know God wants us to do. In fact, if you compare the Gospel accounts, it tells us that before they, they go to Galilee, the disciples meet Jesus three times. So first of all, the angel has said, go to Galilee. Jesus meets the women, tell my disciples, go to Galilee. And then, as, as we read through in uh, John 20, we see that Jesus, Jesus meets them once in a room where they're all gathered together, except Thomas isn't with them. He meets them there. So, he meets them, and I'm sure he said it. Make sure you got it on the calendar. Next Tuesday, meet me in Galilee. A week later, Thomas says, well, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus unless I can put my hand in his hand and touch his side. A week later, Jesus comes back to the room again. This time Thomas is there and meets with him again. I can just picture Jesus saying, now, now don't forget, this coming Tuesday, meet me up in Galilee. It says in John 20, then they're out by the lakeside fishing. And early in the morning, they look out and they say, Somebody's on the shore. Who is it? I think it's Jesus. And they get in there and they meet Jesus again. Uh, and uh, it says in John 20, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he's raised from the dead. So I can just picture them all coming in and say, hey Jesus, what are you doing? Cooking fish? Great. And Jesus said, don't forget, tomorrow we're meeting up in Galilee, up in the mountain. Three times. What was so important about this meeting in Galilee? That's what we're going to look at. We don't know everything that transpired, but what we do know is written for us here in Matthew 28 at the end of the chapter. Verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus set the agenda for you. He says, guys, I'll tell you what. I did my part. I called you. You were with me three and a half years. You watched me. And then I, I trained you. And then I gave you practice. And I helped you. And then you, I taught you to go out on your own. You came back and you saw a great victory. I died and I rose. I did my part. The rest is up to you. Jesus' design for the transformation of the world is not for him to appear to everybody, but for those he trained to pass on to others what they have learned to be true. Jesus says, you know, my plan relies on you doing your part. There's no plan B. That was all there was. Jesus said, I've provided salvation. I've died. I've paid the penalty. But now you need to do your part and go and tell everybody you need the good news. And the disciples did what Jesus said. When we read on in the book of Acts, we see they said, they went back to Jerusalem and they said, this is great, Jesus is alive, let's have a church service. And they met together and stayed in Jerusalem, just had church every week. They weren't doing what Jesus said. They were just saying, oh, this is great, Jesus is alive, we can just meet on Sunday and worship. And so, Acts chapter 8 tells us, God allowed great persecution to come to the church. 
It says in Acts 8, then on, a, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem. And the result says, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So once they got out of their complacency, out of their comfort zones, God had to give them a kick in the seat of the pants and bring persecution so they couldn't stay there. And so somebody said, let's get out of town. Hey, where we're going, why don't we start doing what Jesus told us to do? We need to go and tell others the good news about Jesus. And as a result of getting out of their comfort zones, then they go and do what God has called them to do. Many times we are no use to God because we're stuck in our comfort zones. We're content and happy where we are. I'll be out about the church, but if I, if I wake up in time and at the end, we'll have a good church service, and then I can go out and my week. And we never do the things God wants us to do. We never live the life God wants us to live. This early church, these first, this first generation of disciples, they saw many come to Jesus. You read the first couple chapters of the book of Acts, you see thousands of people place their faith in the risen Christ. And that generation taught the next generation. We find uh, the, that generation who was persecuted, uh, one of the key men persecuting the Christians was a man named Saul, who came to faith in Christ, later changed his name to Paul, and then he traveled everywhere telling people. He took a young man, Timothy, and brought him alongside and trained Timothy. He writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. he says, The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he says, Timothy, you know what? Just like I'm training you, I want you to train others as well. Pass it on. Continue to teach others, to share the good news. So Christ's method of transforming the world was by changing lives one at a time. The disciples had come to Jesus toward the end of his life and said, Master, are you at this time going to restore the, the nation of Israel? They said, are you going to set up the throne and kick the Romans out of here? And Jesus kindly replied, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but the answer was no. I'm not. Because he wasn't looking to set up his throne and rule in Jerusalem at that time. He will one day in the future. But his plan for changing the world was for his disciples to change their lives and tell everybody else the good news of the risen Christ. As we look at the world around us today, it's easy to complain about the, the state things are in, high crime rates, immorality, a sexual pervasiveness in culture, the disregard for God, and everything spiritual. But why is the world the way it is? You say, oh, this world's in such a mess. Why is that? It's not because of the prevalence of sin, because that has always been there. It's because we have not carried out God's agenda. His meeting with his disciples in the mountain of Galilee, he said, okay, I am resurrected. That's the good news. Now I want you to go and tell everybody else about it. And as we look around us, this morning here in Owasso, there are many people who are just now waking up. Why is that? So many Christians, those who claim to follow Christ, simply think that just going to church and leading the good life is enough. But like the early church, they're living in their comfort zones. They're living complacently. And they're not passing on the good news about Jesus. The truth that Jesus is alive is not simply just something we celebrate on Easter. It's not just something to warm our hearts and say, well, isn't this nice? Jesus is alive. Rather, it is a truth that should transform our lives. But far too often, we just have an outward show. When elderly Adele Gabori turned up missing, news reports tell us that concerned neighbors in Worcester, Massachusetts informed the police. A brother told the police that she had moved into a nursing home. So satisfied with that information, Gabori's neighbors began to watch her property. Michael proudly noticed her mail delivered through a slot in the door high and high. When he opened the door, hundreds of pieces of mail drifted out. So he notified police and deliveries were stopped. Gabori's next door neighbor, Eileen Dugan, started paying her grandson $10 a month to mow, to mow Gabori's lawn. Later, Dugan's son noticed Gabori's pipes had frozen, spilling water out the door. The utility company was called to shut off the water. 
when no one guessed, what no one guessed was that while they'd been trying to help, Gabori had been inside her home. When police finally investigated the house as a health hazard, they were shocked to find her body. The Washington Post reported that police believe Gabori died of natural causes four years before. But the respectable external appearance of the home looked so nice <coughs> that nobody thought anything about what was going on inside. Similar thing can happen to people. We can look at other people and they look so nice on the outside. They're a kind person, they're gentle, they, they have a nice family. And it's easy for us to think, yeah, they probably already know about Jesus. They already have placed their faith in Christ. And many times we allow outward appearances to be deceiving. We can go to church and sing songs and read the Bible, but still be spiritually dead inside. Because what changes us is not our outward actions, but rather what is internal, what is in our hearts. Jesus offered the greatest victory over the, that the universe has ever known, victory over death and hell. He paid the penalty of our sins, a penalty that each one of us is born under. And he rose on Easter morning to let us know that that penalty has been paid that we will not have to pay the price of our sins. And he rose on Easter morning to let us know that. And his call to his disciples to meet him in Galilee is a call to learn the game plan for the rest of life. To say, okay, I am risen, now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to share that news with anybody else? Today, you might be here and say, you know, I'm sort of like that house, you know. I, I, I look good, I have a nice moral life, but I don't know if I really would go to heaven or not. I really never made that decision to trust Christ. If you're not sure, today is the day to make sure. To make sure that you are a Christian, that you know for certain that you'll go to heaven when you die. Love to talk with you after the service. But even more, for those who, for the majority of those who are here who are Christians, what are you doing about the call that Jesus gave? Say, oh yeah, I believe that. Uh, as we were going through the study with Rick Warren on Sunday nights, he, he had a phrase he used over and over again. You only believe the parts of the Bible that you actually do. You can say, oh yeah, wasn't that neat? Jesus met with his disciples in Galilee. But, what does that mean for us? The disciples were to pass on to others who were to pass on to others and through the generation has come down to us. And however you came to faith in Christ, whether it's by a, a mother or your father sharing with you or coming forward at a church service or a Billy Graham crusade or just by reading and being convicted on your own, however you came to faith in Christ, what are you doing about it now? Are you sharing with anybody else that good news? Or are you going to break the chain? Are you the link that breaks it off because you're not going to share with us? We know what God wants us to do. You talk about big events, to think that Jesus comes and the angel says, meet him in Galilee. Jesus says, tell my disciples, meet me in Galilee three times, and then he goes and meets him in Galilee. This was important. This is for us. But will we do anything about sharing that news with others? Say, well, I don't know how to do that. Come talk to me something, read through them, and share them with somebody. Don't just pass it out. Some people just take them and put them in toilet stalls and everywhere else. I'm not trying to criticize people, but far better than just blanketing your company with them. Just take one and come to a friend and say, hey, would you read this? Or better yet, hey, can I, can I read this with you? This is a really neat story. Let me share this with you. But sharing your personal faith journey is something everyone here can do. You might not feel comfortable with it the first time, but after you've done it a couple times, it becomes easier and easier. But Jesus wants us to share that good news. Because he wants us to be getting 
He wants us to get in the game, to be transformed by the truth of the resurrection. Now this morning, we have a testimony of a man who has been transformed by the power of the resurrection. That's Joshua Butcher. Josh, come on up here. Josh has, uh, Josh and Christy have been coming to Bethel now a couple of years. But when Josh started coming, he was like a Del Quarry. He was like that house that looked good on the outside. People said, oh, Josh, he's such a nice young man. But Josh had never placed his faith in Jesus Christ. Until back in December, in one of our services, Josh came forward and trusted in Christ and asked Christ for forgiveness of his sins. And so Josh comes this morning to be baptized as a testimony of his faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take off the, this earpiece and we're going to go over into the baptistry. Each of us has an important part to play. In fact, the statistic says that it takes 7.3 contacts with the gospel before a person comes to Christ. That doesn't mean they have to hear the, the gospel from the same person seven times, but an average. And often God uses many people in our lives to bring us to faith in Christ. So today, uh, Josh, let me have you take a step forward. Let me just have you grab your arms. Today I baptize you in obedience to the Lord's command in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For in that raise the walk and do this life. Amen. Let's have a prayer together. Father, today I thank you for Josh and his desire to follow you, for the change that you have brought to his life. And I pray that you would offer your great blessing upon his life. Use him to be a great testimony to others. And may they see in his life something different. May they see a joy and a radiance. And may they see uh, the way he treats his wife and his children with such great love and passion and desire that they want to have what he wants. Help him, Lord, to be a faithful witness for you. And I thank you for his testimony this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> if any of you would like to be baptized, I won't ask you to come up today, but I will say that with the Portable Baptistry, we can set it up any Sunday. Just see me, and any Sunday, uh, we can baptize you as well if you've never had the chance to make that personal, public testimony of your faith in Christ. If you'd like to make a commitment to follow Christ with a greater passion, I'd encourage you just to... Uh, to take some time this morning during the prayer uh, to come at the end of the service and just to uh, make a commitment to the Lord that you're going to serve Him more faithfully. And uh, I'll be around after I get changed. If you want to hang around and talk uh, about your situation or if you want to talk more about knowing the Lord personally. But the praise team's going to meet us and then Joe.
legitimately will close us in prayer.